In the second part of this unit, we are going to talk about security controls. And basically, security controls are things we can implement on a host to help aid in securing that host. So first, we talk about storage. Um, so the book talks about, as far as storage goes, there are three basic way, uh, storage concerns, you know, other than just putting data on a hard disk in the machine. You know, we can, we can control what's in a hard drive inside a host, but what we can't control is things that are outside the host. So they talk about a SAN, which is basically like virtual storage um, or a storage area network. And there are certainly lots of concerns about SANs, number one, uh, when you're using things like iSCSI. In many cases, the data is not encrypted while it's in transit. We'll talk more about that in a few slides when we talk about encryption. Um, but also, you know, the data isn't always necessarily encrypted when it's on the SAN. It's all swimming together with other hosts' um, data. So there's certainly lots of security concerns. But the important thing with the SAN is we do have control because we own the SAN typically. It's in our environment. It's in our infrastructure. So that certainly helps. Uh, your book also talks about big data, which are very large data sets. And the concern that they bring up with big data as far as host-based security is that in many cases, you have to pull that data to a local workstation for processing and analysis. So I work in healthcare. And a good example of this is when you're working with patient records. Uh, in tip, you know, if, if you're doing any kind of aggregation of those records or you're trying to do uh, some kind of study with those records, uh, researchers will pull all that data from an electronic medical record system to their own computer to work with it. Uh, so they could potentially have a lot of patient records all in one place. And if it happens to be on a laptop and it gets stolen, then that's certainly a concern. So you want to make sure that the data is encrypted when it is at rest on a machine. And again, we'll talk more about data in transit at rest and encryption and all that stuff later on. But the last one is something that's really hard for us to control, which is the cloud. So a lot of organizations now are moving data into the cloud. Um, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with things like Dropbox, uh, which, you know, and, and uh, you know, there's a couple of commercial backup services for consumers and for businesses where they basically uh, host that data in the cloud for you. Uh, Google and Amazon are big providers for businesses for cloud-based storage and processing and all that sort of thing. And it's great. It's very cheap. It's very efficient. But once your data is in the cloud, uh, you have very little control of that data. So good example is Facebook. A lot of us use Facebook all the time. And, you know, Facebook is a great case study in how we've all become used to this idea of putting our data online. Uh, but a lot of us post pictures and updates and things like that. And we have no control of that data once it gets posted to Facebook. We have very little ability to remove that stuff from Facebook and control who has access to it. You know, they make us think we have control, but really uh, they have the control. They just give us tools that you know, that let us do things with that data, but there's nothing to stop them from, uh, uh, from releasing that information to somebody. So, so we do lose a lot of control of data. So we have to try to mitigate that. So, you know, do we encrypt that data? What kind of business agreements do we have with those companies with how they can use that data? You know, Google is, is, um, just recently announced that they're going to store data in their near line storage cloud, for 0.01 cents per gigabyte. So you can store terabytes and terabytes of data on Google now for, for merely pennies. Um, and I think it works out to $20 for uh, 20 terabytes of data. That's, you know, that's not a lot. It's a dollar per terabyte. So, um, you know, that's pretty affordable for most companies, you know, for, for that amount of data. Uh, it's certainly a lot less expensive than going out and buying a SAN. You know, a SAN might cost you $10,000 for, uh, you know, for 20 terabytes of storage in a reliable, you know, uh, subsystem, but you can go out and do that with Google for 20 bucks a month. It's a no brainer, but you'll lose control of the data. Why is Google doing it for so cheap? Chances are they want that data. They want to be able to do things with that data. You know, that's why Facebook, uh, you know, stores all of our pictures for free, right? There's things that they want to do with that data. There's a reason they want us coming back to their site over and over again, in their case, probably advertising. I may be a little bit cynical about all this, but it's certainly a big concern and something that we have to be familiar with and understand the risks. As far as encryption goes, so when we talk about data encryption, uh, we have a couple different options. You have full disk encryption, which is where you uh, basically encrypt an entire disk. And there are uh, tools in the op various operating systems that will help you do that, use full disk encryption. Database encryption is where the database engine itself can do the encryption. Now, the advantage to database encryption, and I'll just tell you that this advantage to encryption is that there's overhead with encryption. So with strong encryption, there is a little bit of overhead. Now, computers are getting very fast, and, uh, you know, these encryption algorithms are pretty good now where, you know, the, the overhead isn't what it used to be, but it, there is still some overhead there. 
uh, and every little bit counts in some systems. But database encryption is a little different because you only have to encrypt the portions of the database that are uh, that are sensitive. So, for example, if you had a table with uh, where one of the columns was a credit card number, you can encrypt just that column if you wanted to in some database engines. So that would be certainly be a little bit more efficient than encrypting the entire database file. Um, but you could do that. You could also just encrypt the entire file and you could use file level encryption to do that. So you could do um, encryption on an individual file. So you can choose what you know are sensitive files and only encrypt those files, but leave the rest of the disk unencrypted. So for example, uh, the operating system. It may not be necessary to encrypt all the files for the operating system because there's really nothing sensitive there, but maybe you do want to encrypt the database file and maybe some flat files or um, you know files that may contain customer data, things like that. Uh, so you can do file level encryption. It's another option. You can also encrypt data that goes to removable media, and we'll talk more about this in another slide, um, but you can encrypt that data uh, obviously, you want to encrypt any data that's on a mobile device, so um, anything that's going to a cell phone, and anything that's sensitive data. You know, sometimes it's not necessary to encrypt everything, just the things that are sensitive. But certainly, if you have sensitive data that's going to be on removable media or on a mobile device, uh, it's certainly a good idea to encrypt that data. And we'll talk more about encryption, by the way. I'm kind of uh, very quickly going over these types of, you know, these this encryption concept, that, you know, the important thing to understand about encryption is that we're protecting the data from unauthorized access. Uh, so if somebody gets a file, they're not able to read the file unless they know the key to unlock that file. We're going to talk more about those keys and sort of how encryption works in units 9 and 10. So the last two units in this course, we get into more of the nuts and bolts of how cryptography works. But for right now, just understand that encryption is basically protecting that data with a key. Um, but we'll talk more about those keys later on. There's also hardware-based encryption. Uh, trusted Platform Module, or TPM. This is uh, included with most modern systems now. So most laptops you buy, uh, most computers and desktops and servers that you buy now come with this uh, TPM technology, which allows you to encrypt uh, data using a key that's in the hardware. Um, so usually uh, in Windows, they have BitLocker, which can use the TPM. Um, but you can also create your own key and put it on a USB drive if you want to. So then the USB key has to be plugged into your computer in order to use that drive when you have BitLocker enabled. Um, so this is another option. And again, this is very similar to whole disk encryption because typically this will encrypt the entire hard drive. Um, your book also talks about hardware security module or HSM, which is basically uh, a way to manage and store these uh, encryption keys, which again, we're going to talk about these keys in more detail later on. So we're going to come back to HSM when we get to unit 9 and 10. So we'll, we'll come back to that concept later on. Uh, USB devices, of course, can support encryption. So a lot of USB devices have software that will allow you to encrypt anything that you store on a USB key. Uh, and hard drives, uh, so, uh, some hard drives now have integrated encryption. So they have a way to turn on encryption on just the hard drive. Um, uh, so that's certainly an option. Um, but if somebody steals the whole hard drive, they could conceivably still be able to get the data. So, um, you know, but the data is or can be encrypted on the hard drive. So as far as data security goes, this is uh, what we're talking about here is, is securing data um, in its various states. And, and those states are in transit, at rest, and in use. So data in transit is, for, is data that's being transferred through the network or, um, you know, being transferred over the wire. Um, could also even be data that's being in, it's in transit uh, as it's being you know walked from one place to another on a drive, but uh, basically the one you know the easiest way to protect data in transit is to use network encryption. Usually we're using encrypted networks or things like VPNs when the data is leaving our network. However, some sensitive data it does make sense to encrypt it even on the local area network. So again, I work in the healthcare industry and this is becoming more common where even though we own the network, we still encrypt the traffic, even though it's on a local area network that's under the control of the hospital, we still encrypt all that traffic because, um, you know, there's a lot of people on those networks, people are in and out of those buildings, you know, hospitals are very public, you've got patients, you know, it's the very nature of that business is very public. Uh, so we try to encrypt everything on the wire. Anything that could be sensitive data is going to get encrypted, patient records, billing records, all that stuff. Uh, even though it's it's all local area network traffic. Now, in other environments, that may be not you know, as necessary because you don't expect the public to be on the network. But uh, but one thing is for sure is you're always going to have somebody on you know in the vicinity of a network that you maybe don't want to be able to see 
that traffic. But, you know, again, you have to assess, you know, how important it is to encrypt that data. Data at rest is basically what we previously discussed. That's the data being stored. And I talked about some various uh, ways to encrypt that data uh, from a very high level. You know, the drive hard drives can be encrypted. You do full disk encryption, file level encryption, et cetera, et cetera. So a database file, for example, might be data at rest when it's in a host, um, but it might be in transit if you're moving it from one machine to another, which is, you know, not very common, maybe if it's a backup or something like that. And by the way, backups are usually a, a kind of a sleeper as far as a, um, a file that can be easily stolen that has a lot of important information in it. So uh, a good thing to think about when you're thinking about data at rest is, is backups. They contain a lot of sensitive information. It's basically everything you have in one big file, right? If you're, if you're doing a tar or something like that for your backup. Data in use is, and I used this term ephemeral before in a previous lecture, but uh, which we used to describe data in use, but basically it's data that's in memory or while it's being processed. Uh, so to mitigate that, you can use secure coding techniques. Um, you can use protected memory. So a couple different tricks, but basically data in use is, we know that our data can be encrypted while it's in transit. We know that it can be encrypted while it's at rest. But what about while we're using it in memory? Um, so while we're using data, it has to be unencrypted so we can read it. And that's going to be the vulnerability in that data is while it's in use. So there are some tricks we can use to try to uh, safeguard that data. Um, uh, but again, that's a lot of these things are going to add overhead and complexity. So we have to you know, sort of weigh whether or not we need to do that, layer, that level of data security. Your book talks about permissions. In your book, this is literally one paragraph. Uh, where they talk about access control lists. And basically what they're saying is that an ACL can determine what resources can be accessed by users and groups. Now, in this course, we don't get into the minutia of exactly how to do that. There are other courses like OS Architecture that you can take that talk about specifically with things like Active Directory and group policies and so forth, how you can actually use access control lists. But in this course, really what you need to understand is that an access control list at the host level is determining what users and groups are allowed to access which resources on a host. Um, so what files, what programs, and things like that. Finally, data policies. Your book talks about four basic data policies. Number one is wiping, which is basically how to delete data. So one thing they stress in the book, and, and they're right to stress is that when you delete a file, it's not really deleted. So when you delete a file on a hard drive, the uh, shadow of that file still remains where you deleted the file. It's not actually removed. What happens is you delete a file, and where that file was located is now um, unallocated space or unlinked space. So anybody can now reuse that space. But until somebody actually uses it, uh, the old file is still there, which means that somebody could come along and read that file. So if you have a hard drive and you just go and hit the delete button in the operating system or, you know, or in the file system to delete those files, they're not really getting deleted. So if you just do hit that delete button, take the drive out and throw it in the trash, somebody could pick that drive out of the trash, plug it into a computer, run some very basic tools that pretty much anybody can get a hold of, and they would have access to all that data. So in order to permanently delete that, there are some tools and utilities you can use to replace the Slack space uh, or to overwrite the drive several times. Uh, there's a thing called a DOD wipe that can, uh, that can do this. Uh, if you have a Linux machine, you don't have to purchase utilities to do this and tools. Um, with Linux, you can run one command and do a DOD wipe. It's very easy. You can use the DD command. Um, but you just have to know that this is something that you have to do, and you have to codify this into some kind of a policy to make sure people are aware uh, that when they delete something, you have to make sure it's really deleted. And once you have a device that's been deleted, then you have to figure out how you're going to dispose of it uh, and make sure that data is actually removed before disposing of, those, of that equipment. And I always tell people, uh, you know, if we have drives that we need to dispose of, um, you know, if that drive is just getting tossed or thrown away, there's really no reason that we can't physically destroy it. So, uh, so sometimes we'll drill holes through the hard drive. Uh, you know, once you do that, it makes it extremely difficult to get that data off the drive, even if you haven't done a DOD wipe. Um, so that's certainly one option. So just in general, just to make sure before a hard drive goes into a trash can, you could take it apart or you could drill holes in it, or you can throw away the platter separately from the drive, all kinds of things you can do. Um, so as far as data retention, uh, there are usually rules as to, and, and data retention goes both ways. So uh, again, in a policy, uh, you would want to codify that retention policy for different types of data. Again, I work in healthcare and we are required for regulatory reasons to keep data for a certain period of time. So I live in New Jersey and in New Jersey, we're required to keep patient data for seven years. 
I also work in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, again, we're required to keep data for seven years. Other states require 10 years. Some states are less with only five years. So depending on what state, we have to know how long we have to retain. And that's only certain types of records. Some records you're not required to keep. So for example, I work with customers that, uh, that read x-rays in what they call wet reads, which are preliminary reads of x-rays. And they're only required to keep the data for 30 days. Uh, so their retention policy is no more than 30 days. They don't want to keep that data longer than they have to. Uh, if there is some kind of litigation, it's better if they don't have the data. I know that sounds kind of cold, but, uh, but there certainly is some truth to that. Um, so you can actually open yourself up to more uh, vulnerability if you keep that data longer than you have to. And not just for lawsuits from the sense that I just said, you know, if you're uh, keeping financial data, so let's say you take credit cards and you have a 30-day return policy, there's probably no reason for you to keep the credit card number longer than 30 days. So you might as well get rid of it. It reduces the amount of uh, information that can be stolen if it's not there to be stolen. So lots of good reasons to remove data. But again, there are lots of good reasons to keep data, and regulations are certainly one of the big reasons. Uh, certainly, aggregation of data or being able to do um, analytics later on is certainly a good reason to keep data. Uh, so usually, you would work with business people to identify how long data should be kept, in both legal, business, management, and things like that. And again, this would all be codified in some, into some kind of data policy. And finally, storage. Um, so these policies should define how long or how data, rather, is stored uh, so what data should be encrypted? So I kept talking about evaluating when I talked about encryption a couple slides ago and four or five slides ago, I kept talking about evaluating whether or to what degree you need to encrypt your data or is it whole disk encryption or what in a database, database would need to be encrypted. So in those scenarios, your data policy would help you define that or a data policy would give you guidelines and procedures for that. Um, as far as data policies go, you could take a whole course on uh, IT security policies, which cover a lot of this stuff in much more detail. But this just gives you a little bit of a taste of some data policies that affect host-based security. So again, we have wiping, disposing, retention, and storage. And that's pretty much everything you need to know for this course about host-based security. Uh, we have one more chapter in the book in part five, um, I'm sorry, in part uh, four, which is going to talk about alternative um, or securing alternative environments. So these are uh, all the other things that, that we use in IT that are not computers, so not hosts, not mobile devices, and not applications, and not servers, um, you know, so other devices. So we're going to talk about what those are and how we would secure those devices. So that will be in the next unit, and then we'll be covering cryptography in the last two units. So thank you for watching, and if you have any questions, let us know. Thank you.